Again, reality TV oftentimes can be more so like, it, it's scapegoated a lot, but in my opinion as a therapist, it's more so a symptom of a greater problem that we are all experiencing at a collective and systemic level. Okay, hi everybody, thanks for coming back if you've been here before, or hi, welcome if you're new. My name is Mickey, I'm a therapist, and we talk about therapisty things on this channel. And today, we're talking about the psychology of reality TV because I find it interesting and selfishly want to talk about it, but also because I think this is a useful phenomenon for us to unpack here. For those of you who don't know, we talk about reality TV an awful lot, mostly every Friday. Um, we <laughs> stream um, different reality TV shows live, so if you wanna come hang out with us, it's a really fun time and you should do that. But also, I wanna talk to you about what exactly is happening um, both from a neurobiological perspective, but also like culturally, right? Like there's a lot of chatter about reality TV and there's also a lot of judgment about reality TV. So I wanna talk about that, like psychologically, why are we as a culture um, so fixated with this phenomenon? What about this form of media is so encapsulating? That's not the word I wanted to use, but you get it. Um, so we're talking about that today. Also, if you're new here, hi, thanks for coming. You should subscribe, it helps a lot. Okay, so there are a couple of things that I wanna to talk to you about with reality TV. The first of which being the question of like, why do we even like this thing, right? This is a question that gets asked a lot, both from the psychological perspective, but also from this like very judgy perspective of like, why do people like reality TV? It's like trash, which is shitty. We're gonna talk about that later. But there are like very good and valid reasons from a psychological perspective for why we like reality TV. So let's jump into that. Okay, the first reason that I wanna talk about why we as a culture like reality TV so much is because it's literally anthropology, right? Like we've talked about this before on the channel. For those of you who don't know, we have a podcast. Aaron and I talked about this on an episode of that. But I want to highlight this first and foremost because a lot of the judgment about reality TV is about it being a trash form of media. And I do think it's important to center our attention in the truth of the fact that reality TV is essentially us as people having an interest and a fascination with people's lives and what's going on behind the scenes, right? For a lot of us, there's an interest or a fixation with trying to suss out whether something is real or not, but also about like the behind the scenes of people's lives, especially like conflict in people's lives. There are a couple of reasons why we find like seeing other people's conflict styles and outcomes particularly interesting that we're gonna talk about later. Um, but again, I want to start here because it is important. I know that there are some people who are gonna be like, Mwah. like that doesn't seem true. And like it is, right? Ultimately what we're talking about is that we as people really enjoy watching other people do sort of mundane and like everyday things. And the reason that we like this is because human beings have a natural curiosity about other human beings. This is a phenomenon that is as old as human beings itself. It's not new, it's not novel. This is like a very normal thing for us to like. There there are several facets of this that I think are important to talk about. One of which is the fact that we project ourselves onto the people in reality TV programs. I know that this might be kind of an unpopular take, but like, listen, I think it's true. It's also important for us to talk about that, especially when we look at the way that these shows are edited and the type of content that they're serving us, right? It's not a coincidence, in my opinion, that like, for example, people on reality TV usually end up in some kind of character arc where the editing and the producers carefully craft this image that's intended to help us consume this person through this lens of like a story or a movie like we're used to in media, but in a way that is slightly different in the sense that they're representing more of this person's normal life, right? So there is very much an aspect of like, we want you to identify with this person, right? There are reality TV stars that have spoken out about how their experience on particular TV shows uh, was very much much being guided by producers to be like the villain of that season or to be like the cute, sweet, happy couple on that season, right? This is a thing that we know for a fact is, is happening. And I think it's important to talk about this because the phenomenon of like continuing to up the ante and reality TV taking new and interesting forms, right? Obviously all of that is a product of capitalism, uh, but there is also an aspect of producers wanting us to project ourselves onto other people. This is also for what it's worth, we're gonna talk about stan culture and like hate culture later, but this is also why it's important for us, I think, Thing, to be conscientious consumers of reality TV and to practice our own self-care um, and like self-moderation in regards to the medium because this over, what is the word? Like alignment or like over-identification, over-identifying with people on these shows can be, we're, again, we're gonna talk about some of the potential negative outcomes of this, but this can be a problem for us. And it can also mean then that we are being wrapped up emotionally. Like we're having our emotions sort of played with by like reality TV producers. So I do wanna caution people in that regard. But again, I think it's important for us to talk about this because this interest and fixation that we have, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're consuming the media in the way that it was designed to be consumed, right? Producers do this to you on purpose. And so also in the hope of destigmatizing and making reality TV less of a like 
taboo or like shit upon um, phenomenon, it's important that we acknowledge and honor the objective truth, which is that producers and, uh, you know, content production companies want us to over identify with and project ourselves onto these people in this very parasocial way. And like it works, right? That's why they continue to do it. It's a very, very effective vehicle to get people coming back to watch more and more and more and to watch season after season of these shows because they pull at our like peopleness inside of us. Um, and that's like a very reliable means to get people to engage with the medium. Before we talk more about that, I wanna to talk to you about this week's sponsor, which is Parade. I'm so excited to work with Parade again. For those of you who don't know, Parade is a sustainability and community focused brand. And I have really been loving buying myself some new underwear and bras from them. You all know that I had a breast reduction back in October, but what you might not know is that I was unironically a Parade stan well before then, because Parade I think has the perfect balance of inclusivity and fun. Personally, I am of the mind that underwear is not just meant to be functional, it's also meant to be fun. And as a person who was plus size and also was large busted before my uh, breast reduction, I really struggled to find things that were colorful and comfy and also made me feel good in my body the way that it was. So I love that even now after getting a breast reduction, I can find things that have that perfect balance of being comfy and fun and making me feel good about my body exactly the way that it is. My new favorite bra from Parade is this Dream Fit Triangle Bra because first of all, look at this color. It's called Grape Soda. We love her. Um, but also it's satin. It's so smooth and soft and the color is so vivid and bright and it it just makes me feel super confident and also like I have a fun little secret when I'm wearing it. Um, it's just a confidence booster and a fun thing. And again, I just feel really strongly that like it's something that I have to wear and I love that Parade makes things that are fun and interesting, but also comfy. Like I genuinely do not notice that I'm wearing it all day long. And like, that's really saying something from somebody who is really picky about undergarments. Like I said, I just really love Parade. I'm a big fan of what they're doing over there. And I think that you will really love it too. So if you wanna celebrate your body and show it some love, go click the link in that description. You can use my code Mickey40, that will get you 40 percent off site-wide. So go show yourself some love and also show Parade some love for showing me some love. Thank you so much to Parade for sponsoring this week's video. Let's go ahead and hop back in. The other thing about this that's uh, helpful to remember in regards to us projecting ourselves onto other people is that we have uh, data to prove that folks are more likely to engage with types of reality TV that more closely align with their values and belief systems. Again, we know that this is true and this also speaks to a phenomenon that we as consumers tend to participate in, which is almost this like self inventory process, right? Because we're more likely to engage with types of reality TV that more closely mirror our values and beliefs, this usually results in a process where we in project ourselves onto these people, ask ourselves and our friends and our communities these questions of like, would I do that? Or like, how would I respond in this situation? This is the subject of a lot of discourse on social media of like, I would never have been this person or I would never have made that decision or like, oh, I definitely would be that person, right? This is all in essence, like a self inventory of our values and beliefs. And first of all, I think this is a useful exercise in empathy. Ultimately, what we're doing is placing ourselves in the shoes of another person, which like, obviously as a therapist, I'm not necessarily upset um, about us practicing that exercise. But also this is kind of an interesting social phenomenon in the sense that we are continually reevaluating our values and beliefs and reality TV serves as a, a catalyst for that in some ways, right? It's not uncommon for folks to see somebody in a reality TV program that has similarities to them in their personality and their relationships and to see them make a decision that like is treated poorly by the the general public and to be like huh maybe this is a good moment for me to reflect inward now that i'm seeing like for example the harm of a decision like that maybe one that i could have made being played out in real time I'm feeling very squeaky about this value or this belief. And it is actually a very useful exercise. Obviously there are lots of people who don't necessarily do that in good faith or who will double or triple down on potentially problematic behavior patterns. And that's like, again, that's the thing we're gonna talk about later. Um, but I do wanna highlight this for folks because I think it's important to kind of boil stuff down to its barest essence here, which again is kind of this exercise in evaluating our own values and beliefs. And like, ultimately again, as a therapist, I don't think that that's a bad thing necessarily. Oh, punk ass, sorry. What? <gasps> oh my god i was like i was like why does it look so dark in here oh no we forgot to turn the ring light on um so if you've noticed that the footage has been like different than it normally is. That's why, sorry, that's our bad. I talked earlier about how one of the like anthropological things that we're interested in with reality TV is getting to see other people's conflict. And I wanna talk about this because what reality TV does in essence is normalize conflicts that a lot of us will only really experience behind closed doors or in private. And so first of all, of course, we're interested in that because like we love drama and gossip. Um, we're gonna talk about gossip later, don't you worry. But the other part of this is that there is a, a communal aspect to this, right? It is very 
comforting. It's it's somehow like a feeling of being seen, having conflicts like this normalized and talked about on like a, a public stage, which is also important for us to talk about in regards to the way that a lot of us feel alienated and isolated from our community. We're gonna talk a little bit later about uh, the way that the pandemic changed our uh, perspectives on like community, but also media and things like that. But again, I wanna highlight that us having an interest in the way that other people resolve conflict, feel about conflict, what conflict looks for like, looks like for other people is of course something that we're interested in. And it is also, again, a way for us to feel connected and to feel like we belong here, right? It's nice to see other people have conflicts that either look similar or, you know, sometimes different from the way that we do things because we as people want to feel like we belong somewhere. There's a quote from a Medium article. I listed a bunch of stuff in the description, by the way, for you, but one of the things is a Medium article. And I wanna read you this quote because I feel like it's such a beautiful encapsulation of why we talk about reality TV on the channel. Okay, so the quote says, the primary function of an anthropologist is not to study about humans and to write about them. It is to study about humans to care for them, which again, I think is just such a beautiful encapsulation of like what it is that like, first of all, a lot of people are trying to do when we talk about things in a anthropology adjacent way, but also again, like what we're trying to do when we talk about and platform reality TV, right? There is a community aspect to this and there is a way for us to feel like cared for individually, but also for us to care for others, right? One of the things that we talk about a lot in regards to reality TV dating shows is about how important it is to normalize, for example, setting boundaries or removing ourselves from relationships with folks who have blaringly or, or glaringly obvious red flags, right? Platforming that information, talking about that, creating a discourse about like, no, no, that person is scary or that behavior is bad is a function of uh, preserving communal and, and uh, community safety. That's very important. Again, we're gonna talk it doesn't matter. You get it. We're moving on. <laughs> Another thing that goes along with this is that we as people love to take sides, right? People love to use the word tribalism in regards to reality TV. And while I'm not a super fan um, of that particular language, I do also think it's important to highlight the fact that we as people are drawn to the idea of creating in-groups and out-groups and how we function within these groups. And a lot of that, again, is going to be based on our sometimes subjective, sometimes objective uh, values and beliefs about life and community and things like that. We know that as people, first of all, from an evolutionary perspective, it was essential for us to either align ourselves or remove ourselves from certain groups. So of course we're drawn to that. Um, but also again, this is a form of community, right? This is a way that even though it might sound silly to say, my opinion about which real housewife is the coolest, um, this is a way to form community, right? There are subreddits, there are Discord servers, there are um, chat rooms and, and other places on the internet. This is also a thing, right, where people will get together and have watch parties with their friends or their loved ones. We are forming community around a shared medium and that is an aspect of anthropology that in my opinion shouldn't be dismissed when we're talking about a cultural phenomenon that also is like exceedingly popular, right? We're gonna talk about that later. I keep spoiling little bits of the outline for you, um, but you get it. I do just wanna draw your attention to the fact that creating in-groups and out-groups and our desire and our interest in taking sides plays an integral part in why we as a culture find reality TV so fascinating. So let's talk about gossip. This is another form um, or like, I don't know, it, part of this conversation that's important in my opinion. We have talked at length on the channel in bits and pieces. There is not one dedicated video, by the way, I saw a question about that. I haven't made a dedicated video about gossip. Maybe I will. If you want me to do that, let me know. But we've talked at length in other areas, uh, sort of all over the place, about why gossip is not a bad thing and why as a social phenomenon, it's gotten a bad rap, in my opinion. Now, in the opinion of a lot of other people also. First of all, the things that we know about gossip are that it lights up your prefrontal cortex, which is your reward center, right? This, this, That's the part of your brain those words didn't wanna come out of my mouth. That's the part of your brain uh, that releases all of the feel good, happy uh, chemicals. We're not gonna go into brain chemistry too, too much today, but your brain lighting up during uh, gossiping is something that's noteworthy because this is not just a behavior that we're doing to be salacious or to be shitty or mean to people. Gossip historically has served the purpose of allowing us a, a vehicle to preserve and to create community safety. There is a lot of wonderful discourse on the internet from other people who are like actual anthropologists for example, speaking about the fact that in cultures where we normalize gossip as not a shady or shitty thing to do, 
there is actually a much more fleshed out network of folks who are able to speak about like, no, no, that person is unsafe or that person has had issues in relationships in this particular way or that person did that to this person and has a reputation for X, Y, and Z. And that allows us as a community to create this like network, these little spindly connections from one person to the next where we're all in the know. And so even if like you go on a first date with somebody and you don't really know them, if we as a community are having regular and in-depth conversations about people's behavior, you might not know this person, but somebody that you know knows somebody who knows somebody else who heard that this person has a problematic pattern in relationships. And that saves you, first of all, a whole bunch of like heartache and, and trouble and like potentially danger, but also the time of having to do all of that uh, finding out on your own, right? This behavior, when put in context of like a, a community safety feature, is something that we should not be uh, stigmatizing or labeling as like shitty or fucked up. I think it's also important to talk about, first of all, the fact that this creates a closeness in our relationships also, right? This is a phenomenon in reality TV also. We love to do the like, oh, what do you think of so-and-so? Or like when your friend watches or finally catches up to where you are in the show, you're like, so? what did you think, right? Like this creates a closeness in our relationship and there is like a bonding that happens there when we either share or have differing opinions about particular people. This also holds true for gossip, right? This again allows us to create a, a shared bond and like interest over having either again, the same or different opinions about particular people. I think another thing about this that's important to draw people's attention to is that it's not a coincidence in my opinion and in the opinions of lots of other people who are more learned than I, that people who are targeted by misogyny are oftentimes, first of all, more apt to engage in gossip and also more apt to be judged for engaging in gossip. There is a very loud <laughs> aspect of uh, misogyny in regards to the judgment around gossip that cannot and should not be ignored, in my opinion. I think it's uh, helpful and also healthy for us as people to continue to interrogate how systems of power have seeped into our judgments and thoughts about cultural phenomenons and behaviors, for example, and this is very much one of those, right? If you have the opinion that gossip is inherently bad, that it's shitty or shady or fucked up, or also especially if it's like vapid, the judgment is that it's vain or silly, that it's like something little girls do, right? It's immature, why, right? Where did that value come from? Oftentimes it is uh, from people or places that are steeped in a heavy misogyny and a, a genuine dislike of not just women, but like femininity generally. That's true. Yeah, men love to gossip too. They just like to pretend that they don't. The second thing about reality TV that I think is important to contextualize here is that in essence, reality TV has become a form of escapism for us, right? There's a common parallel that's drawn between reality TV or just like the media that we're consuming nowadays generally and the way that um, movies like the cinema, the theater blew up in popularity during the Great Depression. These things are not a coincidence, right? During times of cultural and political unrest, we as a the species, as a society, society, we're not wired to be taking in all of this fucked up shit all the time. Our nervous systems from a, an evolutionary perspective are not meant to be able to consume and contend with the amount of fucking disaster that we're forced to witness on a daily basis. And so it's natural, it's normal, it's healthy, I would argue, for our brains to seek and to be drawn towards a form of escapism. For a lot of people, this takes the form of movies, um, but especially in regards to the way that the pandemic has shaped our involvement with media and also with each other, the rise of things like reality TV and particularly on streaming services is not a coincidence in my opinion. It's also um, a cultural phenomenon that has continued to gain popularity since its inception, right? Like there is definitely an aspect of it continuing to explode in popularity in uh, relation to quarantine, especially about like, you know, living in a, a world after or like, you know, since the advent of COVID. But I do also think it's important to honor and acknowledge that even without that factor, reality TV has been a runaway success from, from its inception, right? I think for those of us who especially like grew up in the early 2000s and witnessed like Survivor and The Real World <laughs> and Big Brother and all of these shows that were like groundbreaking at the time, we remember the cultural fascination and fixation with these shows because it was the first time that we had really ever seen media that wasn't highly rehearsed or scripted or planned. And so the, the interest and the draw towards this medium has been strong since the beginning and it continues to be um, growing in popularity, which again, also for all of the people who are like, I don't like reality TV, I don't watch it. Like, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure about that? Because like fucking millions of people do. For anybody who tells you that like, oh, I never watch that. Like, 
eyebrow raise from me because again, the, the data, the pure statistics from streaming services, even from cable TV still inform us that millions and millions and millions of fucking people sit and watch reality TV sometimes on a week to week basis based on when the episodes are released. The other aspect of this that's helpful to contextualize is the fact that it's a form of community building, right? We talked about this a little bit in regards to the gossip thing and in regards to us like forming like digital communities around this, but especially um, the phenomenon of like self-guided watching and for, in terms of like binge watching and things like that has really allowed us to engage with the medium in a way that like wasn't typical before streaming services gained as much popularity as they did. And that means that we're more apt to talk about this type of media more often, which results in us forming community, forming relationships and having like a greater general social discourse about this phenomenon. So like, again, of course people fucking like this. Besides the fact that from an anthropology perspective, we're just transfixed by watching normal people do these things that we're doing in our lives. It's also a community building thing, right? Like the escapism, the like natural curiosity that people have and the community building things is like the trifecta for us to be interested in a thing. Of course we wanna fucking watch this, right? If we're getting the dopamine hit of like feeling normalized and feeling validated and doing some maybe introspection about our own selves, we're also uh, continuing to deepen our relationships with the folks that we already know we're building new relationships with folks that we don't know. And we're also getting to escape the actual fucking terrifying doom and gloom that is living in a like post uh, capitalist hellscape Hello? Like, of course we enjoy watching this. When you like, boil, again, this is why I said I think it's important to boil all of this stuff down to its barest essence because when we look at it from this perspective, like, duh, like, of course we enjoy watching this. And also that's not even all of the reasons that we like it. Um, another thing that I wanna talk to you about is our literal neurobiology. We talked about this a little bit in the horror movie um, video, which I will put up here. I think. I'm not gonna go super in depth about the actual biology because I like really do in that video. So if you want a full breakdown, go check that out. The thing that reality TV does is that it's literally playing games with our neurobiology. And I know that that might sound a little bit silly, but like, hear me out. From a biological perspective, this is what happens. Our amygdala, which is like sometimes referred to as the reptile reptile brain, um, it's like the survival instinct in our brain. It's responsible for our like safety center and like responding to conflict. When we watch things that are stressful, for example, like people getting in a fight on reality TV, that activates our amygdala. Our amygdala then communicates with our hippocampus, which conceptualizes the danger and helps us to assess that like we are in fact safe mostly. But then what happens is that our hypothalamus, which is our like control room, it helps to maintain homeostasis in your body and to like keep things the same, like your temperature, for example, our homeostasis releases a, a, a dialed down um, amount of our stress hormone. So things like cortisol, adrenaline, norepinephrine, all of that. It also releases um, a temporary boost of sugars and fats to your bloodstream. It increases your respiration rate and your heart rate and your uh, blood pressure. All of this is designed from an evolutionary perspective to help us escape danger. But when our brain does this while we're watching reality TV, what this feels like basically is like a dopamine and adrenaline hit. If you are a person who enjoys like thrill seeking behaviors, for example, you'll probably recognize this feeling. It's a very similar phenomenon to folks who uh, find a, a particular joy or interest in things like roller coaster riding, driving fast, like ATVs or dirt bikes or um, mountain biking or like whatever, um, gambling, drugs, um, sex, and like other risk seeking behaviors produces a similar phenomenon in our brain. This is because our brains are designed to consume the things in front of our little eyeballs um, as if it exists in front of us, right? When we talk about TV and movies and media, like digital social media, we need to remember that our brains and our bodies were designed to not really, like that didn't exist, obviously, at the time that we were like in an evolutionary perspective, like filtering in and filtering out genetic traits and, and things like that, right? When we talk about like natural selection and, and what the fuck ever, our bodies are designed to consume things like in front of us. So when we watch TV, your body and your brain and your eyeballs interact with that material in a way as if it's in front of you. Obviously at this point, our brain has learned to contextualize a little bit. We do understand in a logical perspective that no, in fact, the people from Real Housewives are not right in front of me. I don't know why I'm talking about Real Housewives. If you've ever watched, watched that show. Anyways, of course we understand from a logical perspective, those people aren't sitting right in front of us, but your nervous system is like, mm, like a little bit sus about that. And so we get a similar um, dopamine and adrenaline and cortisol hit from watching things like reality TV conflict that we do from running away from danger or like, again, uh, thrill seeking behaviors like roller coasters and gambling and, and et cetera, et cetera. Again, there's a lot of reasons why we as a culture and, and as people like reality TV, but there is also a question that comes up of like, 
is this bad for you though, right? Like there is also um, a judgment about reality TV being like vapid or like rotting your brain, especially I fucking hate when people say that shit. But I do wanna talk to you about some of the potential drawbacks or risks. One thing that I wanna highlight from the outset though is that there is no link between increased engagement with reality TV and it having a negative impact on your brain functioning or a negative impact on your intelligence. This is a claim that gets thrown around sometimes. That's false. Reality TV, TV generally, it's not rotting your brain, it's not making you dumber, it's not making your brain function less effectively, it doesn't do that. This is oftentimes a sexist and discriminatory <laughs> criticism um, that comes from a place of, of discomfort or vitriol about not having male-centric media centered. And like, that doesn't mean that reality TV is bad for you. If you are uncomfortable about a, a medium being centered that's not about you or for you or by you, then like, that's a you thing. That doesn't make reality TV fucking bad for you. I do think it's important to talk about the fact that it can be linked to overuse though. Um, in a similar way to anybody who's seeking an escape from like doom and gloom might overuse things like substances um, and other like dopamine um, heavy behaviors like thrill seeking, for example, like we just talked about sex, masturbation, um, um, other forms of media, all of these things tend to be pretty like dopamine laden behaviors. And so it is sometimes linked to overuse in the same way that those things are. Along with that though, I wanna be clear that that doesn't necessarily or inherently make it problematic though, right? Especially this question of like, okay, so, you know, reality TV can be linked to overuse. Does that mean I have an addiction to reality TV? No, right? Not necessarily. I suppose it's possible. Um, I'm not an addiction specialist to be fair. Um, I'm sure that there is probably somebody somewhere who has documented a case of dependency or addiction to reality TV. But as far as what we know from the research, it is exceedingly fucking rare, if not non-existent as a phenomenon. Um, I think it's also important to differentiate here between a temporary fixation and a genuine addiction, right? I talk to my clients a lot in my clinical work about the importance of diversifying our assets is what I call it in regards to our dopamine, right? If we as a person only have one reliable source of dopamine, then of course we're gonna fucking overuse it, right? Like if the only way that I feel alive is by like, cross-stitching, then I'm gonna be cross-stitching every hour of the good goddamn day, right? But like that doesn't necessarily mean that first of all, cross-stitching every hour of the day is good for me, nor does it mean I have an addiction for this thing. I might be temporarily fixated on this thing because it's my only sor source of dopamine. So when we talk about overuse for things like reality TV, if that is becoming a thing that you are feeling really drawn to in a way that doesn't feel good, right? In a way that's no longer serving your best interests, then it might be helpful to you to try diversifying your assets in regards to where you're getting your dopamine from, right? Spending time with loved ones, also for what it's worth, sex, masturbation, other sensual in the, the five senses, sense of pleasure, all of those things can be useful, right? Exercise, meditation, um, good food, things that like are fun or interesting, hobbies, other types of media, there's lots and lots of ways that we can curate a dopamine response in our body. It will look different based on what your interests are and what you're in need of. But if you're finding your, yourself feeling like, wow, I'm like really in a reality TV hole. I don't wanna do anything except for sit and watch this thing. Do try to practice incorporating some other stuff into your life that might give you a similar dopamine hit without creating this feeling of overuse and this feeling of like, ah, I have to watch this right now or I'm gonna have a meltdown. Also, I forgot to mention, this is not unique to reality TV though. Most of the issue here is about folks experiencing mental health uh, issues or distress. And in my opinion, reality TV is more of a symptom of a greater problem than it is like the problem problem, right? We talked like five seconds ago about how lots of us can have uh, struggles with overuse of particular things. If we're feeling like we're struggling to find dopamine in other areas, this is also speaking to a cultural and social phenomenon, which is that like existing in the world today is a little bit troubling, right? Um, to put it kindly, there is just like a limited amount, I think, of dopamine to be had in living in a like capitalist hellscape that steals our life and our time and like, you know, watching our government money be used for a genocide, for example, right? Like that'll do a number on your ability to fucking feel good about your life and the world that you're living in. And so again, reality TV oftentimes can be more so like, it, it's scapegoated a lot, but in my opinion as a therapist, it's more so a symptom of a greater problem that we are all experiencing at a collective and systemic level. And we would be much better served 
personally, I think, um, by centering our attention and also our criticisms um, of the people who are upholding this larger systemic and cultural problem that's creating um, essentially a dopamine vacuum for all of us who are struggling to exist, right? Like if reality TV is a thing that helps you to feel like fucking happy at the end of the day, first of all, I don't think we should be victimizing villainizing the form of media in the first place because there's nothing inherently wrong with it. But also again, if it's a thing that's helping you feel joy at the end of a really tough work day or after you've gone through a really hard time, then like watch the show, right? Watch the show. I tell my clients all the time, especially when we're in a really hard place, now is not the time to be nitpicking yourself into oblivion about whether or not the thing that's bringing you joy is like a good enough thing to be bringing you joy. Sometimes we as uh, people who are trying to just do our best should uh, embrace the idea that like good enough is good enough, right? And this is a thing that's bringing you joy if it is a thing that's uplifting you or again, creating community, it's providing you a temporary dopamine hit, it's satisfying this human curiosity for you. Personally, I think it's something that like is not really going to create enough harm for us to be like up in arms about it in the way that some people are. One other thing that I wanna talk about as a potential negative side effect of reality TV though, is the potential for an inappropriate level of attachment and therefore judgment, and then therefore behavior in regards to our like, you know, our projection of ourselves onto these people on reality TV uh, programs. The first thing that came to mind for me when um, doing situating for this video is the bitch eating crackers phenomenon, right? We talk about this a fair amount in regards to like online criticism of celebrities and other folks and whoever. For those of you who are not familiar, the bitch eating crackers thing is a phrase that's often used to describe the fact that when you just really hate somebody, <laughs> that everything that they do is fucking irritating to you to the degree that we'll have commentary about people being like, look at this bitch eating her crackers, right? Like she's such a bitch eating her crackers and like, she's not doing anything, right? <laughs> like it, it speaks to this phenomenon that sometimes when we, again, are overly attached and have, for example, our own projection of ourselves onto this person that has run away with us, we can become involved to a degree that's no longer healthy, right? This can then lead to behavior like sending death threats or like sending awful things to people in DMs or saying things that are really dehumanizing and shitty. And that's an important thing for us to keep a handle on, right? I think it's really important for us to destigmatize the enjoyment of media generally. And also I wanna encourage people to practice healthy boundaries with this and to also practice a really conscious effort to ground yourself in the truth and the reality that these people are people, right? We talk a lot on the channel when we talk about reality TV and all of those things that like ultimately, all of these people, they're just people, right? They're flawed and imperfect and like a little messy like the rest of us. And then if I, for example, was unlucky enough to have like, I don't know, my fights with Aaron um, filmed and put on the internet, that would be really uncomfortable. And I'd probably look like an asshole some of the time because when I'm in conflict and when I'm uh, uh, activated or like experiencing a, a trauma trigger, sometimes I'm kind of an asshole, right? Like that's just how people are. People are imperfect and people are flawed. We will all put our ass in the street sometime, sometimes. And what the, the point I'm trying to make here is that most of us are just lucky enough to not have those moments filmed and then uh, preserved for posterity to view and to pick apart. So there is definitely an aspect of having healthy boundaries that I think is important. When we talk about engaging with the medium safely, I want to encourage people not just to remember that like obviously these are people and they're worthy of love and belonging and safety and belonging and community, just like the rest of us. But also ultimately you can really dislike someone, you can really disagree with their behavior, you can have really strong opinions about what they've done or said, and also leave it alone, right? You don't need to send people DMs. You don't need to add anybody on Twitter. You don't need to engage with anybody directly. You can have those opinions and those feelings and those be valid all on your own. Talk about those in your community and with your people, but you don't necessarily need to be doing the thing where we're like shouting at people in, in, in the void and, and through the ether. There is definitely like an inappropriate attachment that happens with like celebrities generally. I think reality TV, again, is not unique in this aspect, but still important for us to address. Along with that also is this like fallacy of like continual and never ending self-improvement that gets perpetuated a lot. And I think reality TV has kind of gotten lumped into this, I don't know, thing, this like value, this issue that's happening um, where we as a culture, especially with the advent of like, you know, greater discourse about mental health care and therapy and also like the self-help fucking industry. There is this fallacy that like it's normal or possible for us to be constantly on this journey of like better, 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 better. I'm gonna 
giving me more, 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 more. I'm gonna be continuing to become better and the most actualized version of myself until I one day ascend to godhood and I'll have no more work to do. And like, mm, that's not how it works. That's not how fucking self-improvement works, first of all. But also, that's exhausting, right? That's disordered. There is no world where it's normal or healthy for us to hold ourselves or anybody else to this expectation of constant and never-ending self-improvement to the degree that we'll just like, I don't know, become perfect one day. Like that's not a realistic expectation. That doesn't happen. Um, I can assure you, especially as a clinician who helps people walk through life-changing work sometimes that at the end of a really satisfying victory of like, yay, right? Like I worked on like this trauma or this problematic pattern that I have in relationships. There's still more work to do, right? <laughs> there's always more work to do. And if there's not more work to do right now, It'll probably show up in five, 10 years time because we're people and we're affected by like the world around us and the relationships that we're in. So just for what it's worth in regards to the like have healthy attachments or like d detachment rather um, from reality TV people, also recognize that people are allowed to be messy and like stay messy sometimes, not forever ideally, but they might be messy for now and for the foreseeable future. And like, that's our God-given right. As people, nobody needs to be on this treadmill of self-improvement because again, exhausting and also impossible. So I think it's important at this point to like really bring us back into the fact that again, reality TV is um, a medium that is like pretty heavily judged. And I wanna talk about this as like our closing remarks for this video, because in my opinion, it's not a coincidence that reality TV is oftentimes villainized and stigmatized and judged and also written off as a demographic or as a, a medium when the demographic that most heavily consumes this media is essentially like not cishet men, right? There is a very, very important, I don't know, conversation to be had about the fact that media that subverts or at least just like doesn't center the experiences of cishet white men of power who are affluent and have a lot of privilege oftentimes is not received well, right? Like it's not a secret, I don't think, to most people that the proverbial powers that be in most media production companies, in most like film and television studios, are those people, right? And those people don't super take kindly to not having their stories, their experiences, and also the things that they feel most valued and, and validated for centered in our media coverage and in our like, you know, social discourse in our communities and things like that. So it's not surprising to me, it's not surprising to a lot of other people, again, who are probably much more educated about the phenomenon of re reality TV than I am, that there is this judgment from mostly cis white men, um, that reality TV is like not real media, right? First of all, fuck that. Like, what does that even mean? It's not imaginary. It's not a figment of anybody's imagination. And the idea of media being like more legitimate when it's like scripted is so silly. Like that's not real. That's not a helpful criticism, especially again, because there are so many forms of media that aren't scripted, that are designed to showcase parts of regular human life, like fucking sports, for example. Cis white men love to talk about how sports are like such a cool and real and, and good thing for people to care about. That's not scripted media, right? Like you're literally just watching regular ass people, maybe not regular because they've trained a bunch, but you get it, like regular ass people run up and down a field for several hours or like run up and down a court for several hours, right? Like. That's not scripted media. And yet there seems to be a more culturally accepted value and belief about that type of media being legitimate and like not vapid or vain or silly or dumb to consume. Again, I just think it's important for us to draw attention to the fact that the criticism about reality TV being vain or vapid or brainless or rotting our brains is oftentimes more rooted in misogyny and a genuine hatred for women and femininity than it is anything else. So if you like reality TV, if you enjoy watching your silly little soaps, watch them, right? Give yourself permission, give yourself the write off to um, engage with things that bring you dopamine, that help you to build community, that help to satisfy a very normal and human curiosity about other people and about the world around us. Obviously, I want to encourage you guys to practice healthy boundaries with that, to be um, loving to yourself in the sense that obviously we all want to have very diverse portfolios in regards to where we're getting our dopamine from. But again, generally speaking, I want to encourage people to be kind to yourself, right? Especially because the conversation about mental health is continuing to evolve in such a way that we have to acknowledge that the world around us is very distressing for us to be a part of. And so again, if this is a thing that helps you to get from A to B, or to feel a little bit more uplifted, to feel a little bit safer or happier. Like I struggle to, to point my finger or like look down my nose at that. 
I hope that you guys found this interesting. I like making these types of videos. So if you want me to talk about something else, um, let me know. I'm sure that y'all will have thoughts and feelings about this. So definitely put those in the comments. Also, just as a fun thing, leave me what your favorite reality TV show is right now. Cause obviously like I'm obsessed and I have a lot of favorites, but I'm curious what your guys' um, favorites are right now. So let me know what that is. Otherwise, if you like the video, you can like the video, you can subscribe. Also, like I said, shout out to our podcast on Thursdays and our live streams on Fridays. They're really a lot of fun. So you should come hang out. If you like these videos, you'll probably like those. Um, but subscribe if you wanna support the channel and then you can share the video to help the channel grow and to help each other grow. And I will see you guys next Saturday. Okay, bye.